So hello and welcome. My name is Steve Pugh. It is Monday the 7th of March 2022. Um, I do something called a growth strategy podcast where I introduce you to interesting people that I hope can help your business or career. I'm kind of just picking people generally in the northeast of England but we've had guests from kind of all over the world that have genuine kind of knowledge and stuff to share that whilst it's great to hear from Stephen Bartlett and Elon Musk and lots of really kind of famous people for 99% of people that work in real businesses and work in different kind of networks they kind of want to learn from people at a similar level and that they can kind of you know get inspiration from and stuff as well um so Joe, who I'm going to introduce you to today I've seen her pop around on the circuit for quite a long time but we've never really spoken uh, and then what we kind of, I love to do on this is pick people's brains, find out more about their backstory, where they're from, how they got into what they do, and also share com- some kind of stories as well. Um, if you get involved in the chat, it should pop up on my screen. So if you've got any questions for Joe, uh, and I'm just going to bring you in. So there we go. You're now kind of live. People can see you and hear you, hopefully. There we go. <laughs> is it true that you look petrified? Honestly, <laughs> don't worry about it. It's fine. <laughs> Hello. Um, so is it true that this is your first ever kind of uh, podcast? It's not my first ever podcast. It's my first It's my first live where they can see you, yes. which is why I had to on my LinkedIn post this morning, note to self, don't pick your nose or, you know, do anything like that because people can actually see you rather than just hear you. Yeah. Uh, so it's, yeah. I, I enjoy the Jeopardy. It's scary when you press live and you have 19,000 people that could tune in. They don't, but they could. And that's the thing. It's just, it's the for someone like you especially that does what you do um you you should nail this this is you're like a dream guest which is yeah but that makes the pressure worse (laughs) that's like oh you know we're gonna listen and check and see honestly i'll have clients maybe listening in and they'll go oh she ermed there was an erm there was a she told me not to erm there was an erm see so it's kind of added added pressure but we're just having that no, no, but like we said before the call kind of started that the beauty of long form content is that it's the real person actually kind of comes through that anyone can almost hold an act or perfect pitch or poise for 10 minutes. But you try and do that for 40, 50 minutes and it's going to, the veil is going to come off at some point. Yeah. But yeah. people like that. They like, um, so you mentioned before that you've had, Sp- do you have Spaniels as your dogs? Yeah, I've got, I've got two mad Spaniels, Tilly and Sky. Um, Sky's the old lady. Um, she is, she's getting on a bit now. She's a bit grumpy, but she's really, uh, my daughter says, you're not allowed to say she's your favorite mummy, but she, she, she is my favorite because when I, whenever I've had a illness or when I was pregnant or whatever, she was like Nana dog out of Peter Pan. Do you remember Nana dog out of Peter no. Pan? Who, uh, <laughs> the big, I think it was like a big sheep dog kind of character. And basically she was Nana dog. So she looked after the kids. Um, and Sky is always, she just knows when you're not right. She knows when you're off colour. She looks after you. And then we've got we've got Tilly, who's only, I think she's nearly now one, and she's mental. She's absolutely mental. Anybody out there who has spaniels will know exactly what I'm talking about. She literally doesn't stop moving. Her, her like her rear end wiggles to and fro, side to side, and does not stop. She must burn off so many calories. Um, so Sky's the old lady and Tilly's the the the, the new puppy. And we really got Tilly because we thought Sky was on her way out. Um, but Sky seems to have had a new lease of life since Tilly came along. It's almost like I'm not going yet. I'm still here. So yeah. And anything Tilly can do, I can do better. But it, it's great. They are they're a they're a lot of work, you know, they're a they're a handful because they're just really energetic dogs, but they're really fab. And anyone who's got pets, I'm sure will know that just brilliant thing especially with dogs they do that brilliant thing of you come in from a hard day or a hard day through the screen or whatever and they'll always just go oh I love you I love you whatever's happened I still love you and and that's just best so yeah wow um as someone that doesn't have dogs I appreciate people tell me it's the best thing you'll ever do and it's just it's um There you go. Yeah. Um, would you be happy to give a kind of 30, 60 second kind of intro just to kind of who you are, where you're from? And then when I magically, actually a guy called David's going to do it, magically clip this up and turn it into a four minute best bits. That's yeah. the bit that goes at the start, which kind of sets the scene for the next kind of 40 minutes hilarity uh, on the call. Okay. <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah. So I'm Joe Darby and I now run Voice in the Room. So I go and work with people, individuals and companies doing training to help do this communicating speaking better whether it is standing up in your team meeting or keynote conference or leading your team whatever that communication looks like for you and before I set up voice in the room which has been going about six years I used to be a barrister 
which I did for just over nine years. And then before that, I worked in theatre directing. So in terms of what I do now, I bring a bit of that 20 years experience um, to, to play, working with, yeah, individuals and organisations. Do you enjoy what you do? I love what I do, yes. Because it's yeah. that balance where you can kind of tell, there's a guy called Rob Barker, that or might be Baker, forgive me yeah. either way. I know who you mean. Yeah. Uh, from Job Crafting. And he said yeah. this to me, and it sounds like you've done the same. You kind of take all the bits that you really enjoy doing and just mash them together and then, you know, make a career out of it if you can. <laughs> it's, it's, it sounds, yeah. you know, like you've kind of done that. Yeah, I mean, it, I, there are hard bits. There's a lot of hard bits. Before I started Voice in the Room, I, I'm not from a business background. It's it's not what I do. I've never run a business. And actually, I've not, I've not really worked in mm -hmm. business in mm -hmm. terms of corporate commercial business. Because when you're a barrister, you you sort of live in this little bubble of of being at the bar, not not obviously the alcoholic one, the, the, the bar being barrister's bar. And and that's where you that's where you do all your work. You're in court and you're with clients and, and it's just it's it's kind of a, yeah, almost like a bubble. And then I remember stepping out from that and thinking, oh, like there's a whole other world out there and this is what people do and this is this is business and stuff. So I had to learn a lot mm -hmm. and I'm still learning. We are also learning. Everyone is. I, I had to learn a lot in a very short space of time and I'm most definitely still learning. So that's the bit I find hard. I suppose I, you know, I, I'd probably say if you said to me, do you love sitting there with a spreadsheet, Joe, looking at the figures, I would go, no, no, <laughs> Steve, not love that. But in terms of the helping people and supporting people and doing um, all the training and the work with the people, mm -hmm. that's what I love. Yes. Oh, brilliant. Um, so on the podcast, what I try and do is go through and almost pick someone's like life story in some ways but it's almost when i don't know what you like at school but almost a lot of entrepreneurs entrepreneurs have different traits of maybe what were you like at school oh so, you were swat, is there <laughs> oh there's no I right was, or wrong answers here by the i way. was i found school really tough actually okay. um i i think i don't know what i was like at school i suppose if you'd have asked other people they might have said i was the kind of odd one out really because I was a bit geeky and we were I in the drama drama. club I'm trying to picture it yeah from people I, went to school. I like drama but I, I got bullied quite a lot at school I think because I was a, a, a little bit academic and I did drama and that kind of thing I was the, I was the kid who when the teacher said right we need someone to read this out in class I, I didn't even put my hand up they just picked on me uh, oh yes we know who it is you can do it and so I became a bit of a target for, I mean, you can see I would have hated you as well, I think. Is there? Yeah, yeah, there you go, you see? Exactly, exactly. And I, you know, I had that horrible thing of people chew up bits of paper and then they spit it at you, you know, and, and I remember hiding out in the, it sounds like a bit of a sob story, doesn't it? But I did find school really hard. I, I used to hang out in the library um, because I knew I could sort of sit there and eat my packed lunch in the library and it would all be fine. Um, so I wasn't a big fan of school, to be, to be honest. Um, Are you from um, the Northeast originally? Uh, no, I spent most of my childhood in North Yorkshire. Mm -hmm. um, Whereabouts? And I was born in London. So it's, it's a little village near Harrogate. No one's heard of it. Close it's called Nid. Nid. No one, nobody had heard of it. Nobody's yeah. heard of it. Um, yeah, so a lovely part of the world. God, God's own country is what they say. Um, but, but I did loads of stuff outside of school and um, I guess just sort of trod my own path a bit. Steve, which is probably a story that probably is a story in my life. Yeah. Trod, trod, trod my own path, which I guess is a lot of people who are in their own business. Maybe I, I think. But what I always like to almost, and the reason I like to do that is that when there might, you know, so this goes onto YouTube. I don't do TikTok. I don't get it. I'm too old for it. But anyway, but it goes onto <laughs> YouTube. But the point is, when this gets clipped up, there might be someone that maybe is born near Harrogate or to be honest anywhere that maybe wants to become a barrister, but they're not quite sure. But the point is, they can learn from different people's backstories that. Uh, Chloe last week was born and raised in Middlesbrough a different background different personality different character type but it's the point is you can kind of I felt that I didn't necessarily have great role models growing up that I didn't know any business owners you know and it was that kind of now at the internet because it was invented when I was 15 16 um you you can discover stuff that if you're interested in being a barrister you can google it and you can say well who's done this and how do you what skills do you need what do you need to get to uni that when you know we kind of go through that journey hopefully there are people that you can help through talking about stuff and how you found it and likewise even if you don't find school enjoyable at the moment that that's okay that actually other people do that as well does that make sense yeah absolutely i mean i i went and spoke at a school not so long ago 
and um there was I definitely got a sense that there was kind of an expectation um from the from the pupils that I saw that they they ought to know what they wanted to do mm -hmm. and that's and, true of grown-ups as well just saying <laughs> Yeah, but there was, I, I sort of almost, I could sort of almost feel it sitting on their shoulders, like a pressure of, and, and I actually asked the group, I remember saying, who here is not, not really sure what they don't want to do? And, and there was nobody put their hand up. And I said, well, I know it's at least, at least half of you, because when I've asked who does know, the other half put their hand up. So it's okay. And if you don't want to admit it, and, and I, and I actually was quite, um, I, I suppose I was, yeah, quite vocal in saying that's okay if you don't know what you don't want to do and and you will you will get there and you may go through various jobs to figure that out but but that's okay because I, I feel like there's quite a lot of pressure on young people well mm -hmm. as you said adults as well to, to 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 know what you're doing and know what you want to be and and all those kind of things and it's not always I mean I fell into my first jobs I didn't really sort of have it as a plan mm -hmm. at all what was your first job Oh well, I meant I meant working in theatre, so okay. I suppose career rather than my first job was a as a waitress. That's a whole other story. <laughs> so, with did you go to uni? I did. I, I went to. Newcastle. I never like to make assumptions. Not everyone. That's the. Yeah, no, no. Yeah, I did. I went to Newcastle Uni, um, and I did English literature, and basically didn't have any lectures at all I think I had about four hours a week or something and I felt a bit I would have hated that... you at uni as well because I did mechanical engineering so it was 35 hours all day <sighs> Monday to Friday so I used to hate having to get up after a night out to go in for nine o'clock yeah and there was the yeah. art students that did four hours a week and I was like that's it that was me <laughs> Although I, I actually would have been quite envious of you, I think, because I got a bit despondent in my first year at uni because I felt a bit, I, I, I almost didn't feel like I had enough challenge. I didn't have enough okay. to do. I, I felt a bit lost, like kind of, I don't know whether this is really me. And then I found my people, my tribe, my whatever you want to call it. And from that moment on, I just, I, I absolutely then loved it. And uh, funnily enough, that was um, the uh, Theatre Society. Wow. And that's that's basically where I lived. I literally lived in a theatre um, for for like my you know the rest of the, the the two and a half years after that. Mm. Um, didn't do a lot else really. But the thing is, but that, what I'd find quite funny is that with so I'm a trained engineer. I know how to make stuff and how to think about stuff. But as I've gone through my career, there was a point where it was actually until my undergrad, um, like marketing and business, kind of came on my radar. I was really interested in it because I was crap at maths, but I was good at some of the other stuff. But the point is a skill set that I didn't know existed suddenly became really important. You fast yeah. forward through your career, you start your jobs, you get promoted through your jobs, you start to get into leadership positions. And it was about three, four years ago, I remember I reached out to Alfie Joey, of all people, Northeast legend, mm -hmm. and actually said to him, I'm not funny and I don't want to do it for comedy, but actually are there places where you can go to be taught how to do presentation skills, comedy, how to hold a room how to deliver stuff because actually i can see it's really important for your job and it's just it's but it's fascinating how people's careers go through the the skills that you learnt at uni in the theater studies group and school and other you you just had them early as where yeah. i discovered them late but the point is it doesn't almost doesn't matter but the the crossover between different career paths arguably as you get more senior get tighter if that makes sense yeah yeah so, so what was your first job after uni um so i sort of fell into theater okay and i'd been i directed a few plays at uni so i directed at the live theater and i directed at um it was the gulbenkian studio as part of northern stage which doesn't exist anymore now because then they had a, a whole refit and everything um and then i got asked to direct something with some young people and then it just sort of snowballed from there really um and then I decided I was going to set my own company and do some productions myself. Um, yeah. And then as is often the way, uh, this is a small, quite a small mm -hmm. community, really. Mm -hmm. uh, and you get recommendations or people hear about you and, and things went from there, really. Mm -hmm. um, so it wasn't, it wasn't, I didn't leave uni with a, right, I'm going to do this. I didn't really have a plan, actually. Um, so how then did you become a barrister? Huh. Yeah. So, well, I, I nearly did law instead of English literature and everybody I spoke to at the time when I sort of tried to take soundings as you do from, oh, I'm going to think of doing this. And, you know, well, that's what I tried to do anyway. 
and try and understand whether because I love books. I mean, English to, to do English literature for me was a, a bit of a no brainer because I, I, I love books, I love reading, I was really interested in doing more of that. Um, and a lot of people said, Oh, you can come back to law, you don't have to do it now if you're not really sure. And I wasn't completely sure. You can come back to it and you can retrain, you can do like conversion courses and stuff. So you can come back to it. And so I thought, oh, okay, well, that seems to make sense. I don't really want to start something mm -hmm. I'm not really sure about. I just didn't want to. And I and I knew also doing a law degree would be a bit like your degree, Steve. <laughs> Lots of hours, full on, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I just didn't have that desire at that point in time. So I did the English literature. And it was only after being, I can tell you the exact moment. <laughs> House of this the exact moment when I decided I'm going to give the bar a shot. I was standing in the shower in a flat in Bristol. There we go. Picture that, if you will. <laughs> that's that's probably put everybody about to put everybody off their tea, isn't it? On a on a Monday tea time. Well, okay, I'm uh, quite. It's what what I kind of find funny is when you have conscious thought about stuff. <clears throat> you know, when you try and concentrate, like in an exam, you sit down, you try and concentrate, or you've got that email to bash out, you can't be bothered, you're a bit frazzled. Trying to concentrate never delivers your best work. Often for me, it's when you have that subconscious thought when you're doing other stuff, be it in the shower, or for me, driving kind of works, or running, or random stupid stuff, is often when I do my best thinking. So it yeah, makes perfect no, sense. Totally. Yeah, I totally agree with that. I always say, I always say to all the people I work with when we're doing presentation skill stuff, and we and we and we work through some ideas. I, and I always say to them, uh, right, this is going to be really hard because you cannot think of creative stuff when someone says, think of something creative. Mm -hmm. And then I have to say, but I'm afraid we're doing training, so I kind of I can't wait for you to go for your run or have your shower or go and chill with Netflix and come back next week because that's not how it's going to kind of work. But I but I do always say to them, I absolutely promise you tonight. When you're stirring the kids' tea and you're just listening to the radio, this it's idea of popping to your head, yeah. yeah, and you'll be like, oh, that's it. That's what I should have said to Joe when we were doing that earlier today because that's when you're, like, totally, that's when you'll think of it. I, I do when I am when I go running. I went running this morning and I did have a good idea. Always, always when I'm running. How yeah. do you capture your ideas? I'm an email person, so I email myself mm -hmm. the idea to then pick it up when I get home. Oh, that's very efficient. Oh, no, I'm, I'm, not, yeah. I'm not that efficient. No, so when I'm running, on it. Honestly, I just try and remember it. So often I say it out loud. If, if you see a mad lady going down the street kind of saying something out loud, it's probably me trying to remember an idea. On, honestly, because if I stop, I suppose I could stop and write a little note on my phone. Mm -hmm. but if I stop, I find it I find it really hard to get going again. Like the truth, the truth is, Steve, I'm actually a sort of fast waddler. I'm not really a runner. Um, so to, in order to keep the fast waddle going, I can't stop. I have to just keep going. And then and then when I get in, I'll write down, I'll write down the idea. That's what I'll do. So I'm can I pick your brains on the barrister thing? Oh yeah, sure. Because I'm interested, what is it? <laughs> okay. Well um it's if you see anything on TV where they've got a wig on their head and they look like they're in a court, that's that's them, that's that's mm -hmm. Barrister. Um, it's basic, basic, a good way of thinking about it is like an advocate and being, you are the voice. Mm -hmm. You are the person who makes the argument in court, basically. Um, so standing up and speaking on behalf of um, your 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 client, putting putting the case forwards, putting putting the story that, that your client says is their version of events before, mm -hmm. before the court. Um, so is it different um, to being a solicitor? Yes, although less so than it used to be. So uh, the, the roles have merged a little bit more now, but essentially a solicitor is the person who prepares all the documentation before they go into court. And often they can cover a broad range of topics as solicitors, but you do also get very specialist legal solicitors as well. Mm -hmm. So they'll prepare all the witness statements and all the documentation, all the briefs, all the bundles. And the barrister is the person who takes all of that Presenting. and then does the speaking. But nowadays, um, solicitors can get what's called higher rights and, and, and have been able to for ooh, quite a long time now, e even when I joined the bar, which allows them to do the speaking in some courts, mm -hmm. although still can't go right up to the highest courts to do that. And some solicitors like to do that and they do more advocacy and others are don't do, don't do that at all. So, yeah. But essentially, one does the speaking and one does the 
documentation and, and all the compilation of all that yeah see my wife's going to hate me asking that question but it's for youtube i, I, need, I like the simple explanations for people she's a okay. partner in a law firm so that's why I'm oh asking. she's going to hate me she'll she'll probably say to you she's got it wrong it's not that at all. oh no oh no no it's, it's, it's the acid <laughs> test of being able to explain anything is doing it exactly like you did perfectly that a child would understand so it's just i just i'm a child so that's why i like to it's gonna ask but what's again interesting that what you've managed to do is take different things that you're interested in and kind of mash it together mm. so then fast forward me through you were barrister for nine years give or take so yeah just under 10 yeah exactly yeah and then yeah. would it be right in saying that at some point you got an itch to do something else it, it wasn't so much an itch it was um a combination of a lot of factors and pressures, mm -hmm. if I'm honest, mm -hmm. that, that made that decision. So it wasn't one thing and it took me a long time to make the decision um, to actually finally leave. But I, I was working really long hours, mm -hmm. which uh, is not uncommon at the bar or indeed if you're a solicitor or for lots of people. Mm -hmm. um, but I was working very long hours. And obviously when you're doing family law, it is acutely mm -hmm. stressful stuff. Mm -hmm. If you're thinking about the kind of material and the, the, the sort of material that you are seeing day in, day out, you know, graphic stuff. And it's a lot of it is uh, legal aid. So you're reliant on the government, reliant on the government paying you and deciding how much you get paid. So it's not all fat cats and insane bills and uh, don't believe what you read in the papers. OK, and um, I also have my daughter. So I've got a nine year old daughter and I had her and then a few other things going on. And I'd been doing it for a pretty decent length of time. Mm. And I just had that kind of moment of this is feeling increasingly hard and um, increasingly stressful and something's going to give or something's got to give but also at the same time for, for a few, few years actually I'd been when I when I would arrive at court you'll often get a lot of people sitting waiting to go into the courtrooms for their mm -hmm. case to start so you'll have professional witnesses like like doctors or psychiatrists or whoever sitting waiting uh, and then also just what, what, what we would call lay witnesses the members of the public sitting and waiting and also solicitors waiting with their clients to, to go in and I would often hear and people would often say to me as well I don't know how you do what you do I, I there's no way I could stand up in there and, mm -hmm. and do the speaking or professional witnesses saying I'm really nervous I, I'm I'm worried I'll say the wrong thing or it'll come out like a ramble even though I'm an expert even though I know what I'm doing I I, I just feel so nervous I I feel sick I don't want to do it etc etc and I was I would listen to all this and think I I, I can help with this mm -hmm. I I could help with this I could help with this oh could that be a thing maybe that could be a thing um and I didn't, and I, I can look back on it now and I can see that I thought that could be a thing, but I didn't really make that association. And it actually took me sort of six months of head scratching after I left to think, what am I going to do? So I didn't, I didn't leave. I didn't leave going, oh, I know what I'm going to do. It's going to be this. I'm leaving. Off mm -hmm. I go. I, I really did have that. Yeah. Head scratching, that kind of hiatus. But I think I th that is incredibly common with lots of different people. You have loads of people, you know, was in America, it's called a great resignation, but there's so many people that are in jobs and they're not really loving it, but they don't hate it enough to quit and walk out. And they've got bills and overheads to pay, but there's that nagging feeling inside them that's not quite right. So I think what you're saying is, is really kind of resonate, uh, will resonate with a lot of people, that it's, that's why for me, it's good to kind of talk about and stuff. So before we go into some of the kind of the techniques and stuff, would you like to tell people what is Voice in the Room? Kind of what do you do? What's the business? Um, well, pu pu public speaking training, really. So I do different courses mm -hmm. um, and from people who need more confidence and want to feel more in control of their nerves because I don't really believe in getting rid of them completely because we mm -hmm. all need a little bit of that energy, really important. Um, so that that level, right the way through, I do present with impact, which is much more about your presentation skills, your clarity, your messages, mm -hmm. engaging people in an interesting way, which a lot of us struggle with. And then right through to speak like a leader, which is more the leadership kind of mm -hmm. stuff. So if you're having to step up and speak more in a leadership kind of role. Um, and I'm very practical. So we do a lot of speaking mm -hmm. when we do training because 
if you're enjoying it and you're actually doing it, I feel is the best way to learn. I'm not very chalk and talk. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, the, so the weeks are different. Depends whether I'm doing group training um, or if I'm working one-on-one with people. Mm-hmm. And then also like, as you know, as, as loads of your listeners know, doing all the, what I call the business admin around all of that as well. Oh, and then podcasts like this. Yay. So one thing that crossed my mind when you brought up on your post this morning, that it was your first live podcast that you said before your business is screaming out for a podcast by the same name of voice in the room i think be... oh don't don't start steve don't don't <laughs> but as your new pseudo business coach the ability yeah. to create content and talk like i love talking to people and i'm genuinely interested asking stupid questions about what is a barrister so actually what this allows me to do is meet interested people every week and kind of do promotion at the same time and it's but i enjoy it but you'd be but so much better at it than I am. I just, I love talking to people. I love tech. I love businessy type stuff. So I've just glued it together. You should do it. Yeah, I, I, maybe I should. I feel like there are a lot of things I need to do. Like the number of people who keep saying I need to write a book. Oh my goodness. I feel like it's a little bit like when you get married and then people say, so you're having a baby. And then when you have a baby, they go, are you having any more babies? <laughs> but you are right. I should, I should, Steve. I just haven't got around to it yet. Are you no. allowed to say that? Of course you are. But it was just, especially, Thanks. it's even in the name, that it should be the Voice in the Room podcast. You'd be ace it. Because the, the truth of it is, and you'll know this better than I do. So I'm an engineer, and I like to talk to people. That's quite rare, that a lot of us are quite reserved and kind of nerdy. But having the confidence to actually put yourself out there and stand on a stage and stuff is scary for a lot of people. Mm-hmm. And actually, one one the roadmap, I've had people say to me, actually, this guy called Greg, who's not... English isn't his first language. Mm-hmm. And he actually said to me in a classroom session about two months ago, you know what, I, I don't really feel comfortable doing certain things. I'd love to for you to have a guest on the podcast. You can teach me more about, but the point is, I think often you get people that have a nagging thing that they'd like to work on, but they never reach the action threshold to actually do something about it. Mm-hmm. And often, you know, long form content, when we click this up, ah, oh, that Joe lady seems quite interesting. Yeah, I'll Google that. But I think, you know, it's that balance of where I know how, you know, you could be a technically brilliant engineer or whatever, but if you're crap at presenting or talking to people, you're never going to get promoted to there because they don't see you as being able to articulate ideas and have confidence and stuff. Um, yes. So kind of, I get it, you know, and but I see it every day that ironically for clients, I film video and stuff for them, as more, depending on what I'm doing. And so many of them hate being on camera mm. and it's one of the i'm not going to answer the question but it's almost but it's it's ways to just make things easier for people because it is a big scary thing and everyone's worried about getting trolled and what if what if you're not very good and what if you look stupid or you sound stupid or you hate how you look and so like what what do you find are the main kind of reasons why people want to do kind of public speaking training oh it's such a big topic isn't it Steve but and everybody is different everybody's different confidence is a massive factor because it it goes up and down and and it doesn't matter how confident you seem on the outside either as well it can ebb and flow over the course of a day and an hour and all the rest of it there is definitely a a fear factor of uh, I'm going to make a fool of myself or I'm, I'm going to let myself down or let myself or let my team down or, or look like an idiot. And that, and that can really come into play. And the, I, oh, there's, so, there's so much stuff I can give you. One thing I think a lot of people don't pay enough attention to, if that's maybe the way to describe it, is that it's the skill. Mm-hmm. The more you do it, whatever that looks like, the better you will get. I absolutely guarantee, guarantee. It's a bit like saying, go and do a driving test, but don't have any lessons. Uh, what? Um, um, create someone's wedding cake, but no recipe and never bake a cake before you attempt it for the first time, literally. I always say, take every opportunity you can mm-hmm. To, to practice your speaking, which is can be a really terrifying prospect, I realise, mm. for a lot of people. But it's almost like, does somebody want to do a five-minute um, debrief at the end of our next meeting? Put your hand up. Mm. Tr- 
take the opportunity to do the things that don't seem so, so scary. So not the who wants to do the keynote at our next international conference. If that's too far, leave that one. OK, all right. And do the debrief. OK, or, or even um, the video call to explain two minutes on this, mm -hmm. whatever that looks like for you, because if you can do that, you feel a little bit more. Uh oh, that didn't go so badly. Right. OK, great. Then take that and then do the next one. And the more you practice, the easier it will become. I mean, when I used to take a holiday from being a barrister, so I'd literally take uh, two weeks off or whatever, I would get back and I'd have a three day, five day hearing as soon as I got back. And the first day was always horrible because I, I genuine, and I did this as a job, genuinely I'd have that slightly sort of, oh, can I speak? Is it going to come out? Oh, no, that didn't sound very, uh, uh, because you had to sort of get yourself back up to speed again because you've been away from it for two weeks and it was only two weeks. Mm -hmm. And by day two, it's all fine. And oh, yes, I remember how we roll here. Off we go, da, 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 and off you go again. But it's no different. And sometimes I work with people and say, oh, well, I, I, the last time I did this was six months ago. Well, mm -hmm. with, the, with the best will in the world, it, it, it will feel nervous making. I mean, if it, if it was, <clears throat> I had a, a big gap when the pandemic hit, all my, as I'm sure many of your listeners will understand, my business just fell off a cliff, mm -hmm. literally fell off mm -hmm. a cliff. So I had the whole summer, so it all kicked off in it, February, March, and I had the whole summer booked in with back-to-back -back training in person. And it all just got either cancelled or, or a lot of people were very good and said, we'll, we'll pick it up again when we can, but we can't at the moment. And for a few months, I was like, what am I going to do? And then in the end, I, I took it back and I did it online. But I remember when I, and it was the same content, mm -hmm. albeit I had to fiddle with it a bit to make it work. And I remember doing it for the first time, absolutely terrified, terrified, thinking, oh, well, first of all, I was thinking, is this actually gonna work online? Mm -hmm. Ooh. And I, I don't do tech, Steve, it, it terrifies me, it really does. Tech is not my, so I understand that people I work with maybe feel the same way I feel about tech. So that's my point of empathy is that I kind of think, okay, I, you feel like this, how I feel about anything tech. Um, but once I'd started and I'd realize, oh yes, okay. And I got my rhythm again and then I'm doing it regularly, then it becomes easier. And, it, and it's kind of no less for um, speaking and communicating, I guess. But I don't know whether you were sort of thinking tips for managing your nerves and feeling more in control. Well, or... I, I, I still find it funny because even before we came on air and I've done over 90 of these now, yeah. I still get a little bit nervous. So I do my Amy Cuddy power poses, and like we both stand up. It's something we talked about as well. Yeah, yeah. I'm standing now, and you're standing. Yeah, yeah. But it's yeah. just you've probably seen. I I move around, but I I can't sit still. <laughs> and what's quite funny is that if I I'm, I'm terrible on video calls when I'm sat down, because it looks like I'm disinterested. But I just yeah. I move about in my seat. I must be a nightmare in the cinema. It's so actually for me. I like to stand up and I like to gesticulate and I like to just bounce around a little bit just because that's what I'm like. Just... No, this is this is so cool because I've never met someone who stands up like I do, which is awesome. And it's the one I, I I share this with my clients when I work with them in group training and actually say, because when you're through the screen, your positioning is so crucial because to get through a screen, mm -hmm. basically when you communicate through a screen, you'll know this, it's a bit like putting a blanket over yourself literally throwing a blanket over yourself because it muffles everything so you actually have to work harder to get through the screen to make the connection with people through the screen um and for me and my style of communicating and it's not the same for everybody we are all completely different but if if i don't have that freedom to move around mm -hmm. and, and be stood and use that energy it, it feels very weird and like, like you said and and it, it's a really good one to try for any listeners out there. Try it. If you're thinking, I'm not going to stand up all day, Joe, that's fine. But try if you've got a presentation online, if you've got an important meeting where you know you're going to be asked a few mm -hmm. tricky questions or whatever it is, try just for about 20 minutes, half an hour, try standing up. I promise you, absolute game changer, promise. I always advise people as well to um, do phone calls standing up. Mm. Difficult phone calls, do around. it standing up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it translates in your voice. It will calm out, you know, down down the phone for sure definitely but if you're going to stand up don't forget you need to adjust your screen <laughs> you're going to have to get the ironing board and get the amazon boxes and do a bit of stacking up and a bit of readjusting because you need your camera and your lens that you're looking into because that's where you should be looking mm -hmm. i still need loads uh, of people see, i 
Well, no, so basically, this is someone that is ob obsessive about every detail about everything. So yeah. when I when I when I first started doing the podcast and the interviews, for the first ten guests or so, I had my laptop, but I would look into the camera all thing, and when I watched them back because I have to because I edit them, it was a bit creepy. And the, the the thing was, it was almost it was like I'm psychotic. Where it didn't feel comfortable as a viewer watching someone when someone's eyeballing you, really hard for like an hour. It, for me, it didn't work. So what I do in this current setup, I view my Zoom window, but just above the camera, so it looks yeah. like I'm looking in your general direction. When you speak, people watch your window anyway, so they can't see me. Well, they can, but you know what I mean. But it's just it's not as creepy, and that's just the personal taking it. But so I purposely don't look into the camera apart from when I do the intro because I'm worried about the experience on the other end, if that makes sense. Okay, that's really, really interesting. So I, I always say to people to look at their green dot only because I still probably meet oh, at least 60% of people kind of look who look at themselves. Oh, I hate that. I hate or, that. Or are, are, are looking somewhere else, like down here the whole time. And it, it's still really common, Steve. So, oh, I agree and, with you. Yeah, so I always say, we always have a discussion, where's the green dot or where's the lens? And and of course, if you're very important, and I do agree with you, you don't want to be necessarily looking at it the whole time, but a lot of the time, and if you're speaking to a group, check in with the group. So I always do a sort of, okay, so Tina, you're here on my screen. Tony, you're just off to the right. I'm looking at Tony. Now I'm down here. I'm looking at you, Steve. Uh, Sandra, you're in the middle. Lindy, you're off to the left. And I show what it looks like when I move away and when I go around the screen. But I can... I see really visibly on the faces of the people in my group when somebody who's not been looking at their camera suddenly looks at their camera mm -hmm. and you can just see people going, oh, and, and they feel like somebody's actually engaging and trying to connect with them, which is obviously what we're trying to do when we're through a screen, which is so hard. But I just want to be back in person more. Please, can we do more back in person? Because the other thing yeah. you're very good at is gesticulating with your hands on camera if that makes sense because yeah. again so much so much of your communication is is with that it's part of the reason why i like to stand up and i zoom out a little bit so you can kind of see me kind of waist up yeah. but it's just but a lot of people don't think this and it's just especially with, let's face it we're all kind of bored of zoom now but yeah. it, there are ways to like you're just like firecracker you're, the energy that you bring through the screen is like off the charts so it's you know that's your job but it's <laughs> nice as where well. i've interviewed guests before and it is like pulling teeth and by we're 38 minutes in now i'm just like please just make it end please just make it end as well it's nice to just talk to good people yeah. and the truth is it kind of i think it does come across so if you were to give people like three top tips to just gain that little bit more confidence in what they're doing be it mm -hmm. online or in person or whatever what would it be don't forget to breathe <laughs> I know this sounds really obvious. This is actually a really good one as well if you want to feel more in control of your nerves, which if you feel more in control of your nerves, you will feel more confident. Um, and we do often forget to breathe. Or we don't breathe properly mm -hmm. when we do our speaking. So shall I, shall I do a little, this is a, this is a really good tip exercise, which might be really useful. Um, literally, all you're going to do, you can do it together, Steve. All you're going to do is you're just going to breathe in for three, breathe in for three and then pause at the top of your breath. So literally hold your breath just for a split second. Don't hyperventilate or anything, just for a split second. And then let your breath out again. And that's it. So you just breathe in for three, nice steady breath in, pause at the top and then breathe out for three. And what you really wanna try and do is make sure so often we breathe really shallowly. We just mm -hmm. do a <laughs> from the top of our chest which doesn't give us really good oxygen, which is what we really want. So we breathe nice and deeply. And when you pause at the top, it sort of allows your nervous system to recalibrate. Mm -hmm. I expand on this a lot more when I do my training, but essentially that's, that's what's happening. And you allow everything to settle. So you've got a chance to kind of gather yourself before you then go and do your bit of speaking. And the brilliant thing about it is, is that unless you're going and no one knows you're doing it. Mm -hmm. So it's quite it's a kind of little secret tool that no one knows you're doing, which is a good one. Do you ever get um, dry mouth? Yeah, dry mouth is, is a thing. Dry mouth is a thing. And always have some water. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've got some now. Oh, you've probably got some somewhere mm -hmm. in case you, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, always have some water. And there's nothing, I think people get really nervous. Oh, I can't have a drink. I can't. Of course, yeah, crack on, have a drink. Just do whatever you need to do to do that thing. Um, what was I going to say? A really... I'm going to sound like a stock record. I always think I sound like a stock record when I do my training because I bang on about this till the cows come home. 
practicing. We've talked, touched on it a little bit already, taking all those opportunities. But if the first time you go and do your presentation or your debriefing in the meeting or your keynote speaking or whatever it might be, the first time you do that and the first time you hear what you're going to say is in front of your audience, oh, how, how terrible, how horrible is that? that? That's not, in my view, that's not a good place to be. That's not going to fill you with confidence at all. So I would always say, try and find time to have a little practice. And I know we're also <clears throat> time poor, aren't we, Steve? We're, we're time poor. But even 30 seconds, just 30 seconds, how are you going to start? What are you going to say? What's the first thing you're going to say? And if you practice your first 30 seconds, then by then you'll be a bit more, oh, my voice spoke, that's it, good, it came out, I knew what I was going to say, I'm okay, no one's laughed, no, nothing's happened, and then usually that's the point that we can settle a little bit more, and then mm -hmm. and, and then off we go. So I'd always say, yeah, practice. Do you use, uh, like, bullet points? Yeah, bullet points can be good, yeah. Because yeah. the thing that I've noticed as well is you throw in a lot of humour, which... Do I? Yes, you do. Oh, do I? Yeah, you do. Yeah, like, because okay, you know, I speak to a lot of people, I get to vibe off, you know um you know do you know a lady called ashley king yeah yeah so ashley i'll tell you a story in a second but she realized that when i speak to different guests i act differently and if she's watching this she'll see this and so there's a guy called doug dimwitty dimwitty who was on a few weeks ago very laddie lad we we're talking about sports and and i went into more lad banter mode and it just it depends on who you're talking to but there's nothing worse than Oh, my the, my pet peeve is when you see someone speak on a topic and they're reading off notes and they're literally yeah. line by line and it's like for fuck's sake just yeah. and uh, it was it was a politician once actually it was a, an energy conference in newcastle and he lost the room within 10 seconds because he was reading is where the best people for me they might have some notes mm -hmm. but they just talk to the room and it might not be quite as word perfect but they engage with you and I just much prefer that. Yeah, no, I totally mm -hmm. agree. I, I talk about um, have some signposts. Mm -hmm. So if you think of your speaking, and, and when I say speaking, I'm being very broad and general, mm -hmm. whatever whatever it looks like for you. If you think of your speaking as going on a little journey, it could be a two minute journey, it could be like a 20 minute journey, and you want to go from the castle to the cathedral, okay? <laughs> Um, so you need some signposts because you're taking your audience on that journey. And if you don't have the signposts, they're going to take the scenic route via the river and have donuts in the cafe and sit there all morning. And that's a disaster and you won't get them to where you need them to be. So if you have your signposts, then you can keep them on track. But also for those of us who might have a little ramble or like a bit of a waffle, it kind of keeps us on track as well, which can be really useful. And even if you've only got three or four or five signposts of those headings of where you know you're going your topics mm -hmm. whatever you want to call them and, and you know okay the next thing I talk about is the process okay I'm just gonna I'm gonna have a chat about that then then that can come across I think as much more much more genuine mm -hmm. more authentic um and and you, ha you have more ability to to engage and, and connect yeah which do you is... enjoy what you do do I enjoy it yeah 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 I I, I just really love people um I like working with people and I like helping people. That's that's really why I do what I do. Um, just mm. sort of seeing the the joy of some people, you know, at the end of the day, and I've seen the transformation that they've gone on. But the best bit, because I always get the groups to feedback, so the groups feedback before I say anything. And the best bit is when their colleagues are like, "Oh my god, I can't be like." That's um you it, look how you were this morning and I can't believe you just done that and because it's their colleagues telling them they they I mean in a way that's that's worth way more than me saying anything mm. because it's the people who are around them every day who know them who mm. I know, I don't know them they know them and they they can see how Sandra was this morning and how Sandra is now and to me that's just that's that's why I do what I do I just that's yeah that's it. Um, but it, it, it's true that when you walk into a, a networking event. And people are just confident in a room and they talk to people. And so the first time I met Ashley King, ironically, but it's, you spot people that stand out, but you kind of, you pay attention, but it almost, it needs that little bit of confidence that someone who is anyone that could speak on a stage, especially if you're not expecting them, you just, you're at a conference and you see them, you remember it because you know how difficult it is to do. Yeah. And it's just, it's it, it for people's careers. I think the difference it can make to really skyrocket or not, arguably, yeah 
is that it's your ability to communicate and engage with people and you know do they believe what you're saying and actually are you confident in what you're saying arguably more than the content yeah. that you're telling them no I, I totally agree Steve I, I, I just think it's such an important skill and I, I think we are I feel like over the past couple of years the penny is dropped a bit more mm-hmm. I agree. Just generally in, in business i feel like it's become much more of a there's a lot more awareness about it mm-hmm. um i I've, i feel like it should be something that is taught in schools i think it should be on the national curriculum that's my little um when i get around to all the other things i've got to do that's my little one woman mission to try and put it on because i think for kids mm-hmm. they haven't just had a pandemic the ability to be able to communicate is just like massive you know you can go off and do a degree in mm-hmm. physics Mm-hmm. and be the smartest in the class if you can't go into your job interview and articulate what mm-hmm. you can bring to the party or, or you know what you love or whatever it is then what's the point very um, very true um it's on my list of questions for my little signpost to get you from the castle to the donut yeah, shop yeah. um what's your dream for the business what is it lifestyle is it impact is it what's the dream um well, I had I, I I sort of scratched my head a little bit with this one because really it's quite it's quite simple. It's not I don't have it's not a big very specific thing, but really I'd like to keep helping as many people as I can in the most effective way that I can. Um, I suppose in an ideal world, it'd be really nice if if there's someone somewhere who says to their colleague at work, oh. I really need to get some help with this. And I, I really want someone who I feel I can trust and who will really get me to where I want to be. And then they say, oh, I know the person you need. Yep. You need to speak to Joe Darby, a voice in the room. That that to me is, I feel, a, a good a good place to be. But I don't really have, um, you know, financial goals or, or things like that. It's just, in it's that just enjoying it. And it, But the thing is, I guess, yeah. on the back of that, it's the... The fact that people respect what you do and they see the value in it that they would recommend you yeah. is a really nice kind of thing. And the thing that I also get as well is that with, especially with long form content, you get a vibe off different people that there are other presentation coaches out there <clears throat> that you might prefer them or you might prefer, but that's the the beauty of being able to pick. And it's yeah. just, it's, it's, a, I find it really funny that I know that there'll be people that hate me, but they're just not my target customer. <laughs> I'm just yeah. not their vibe. They just want a different animal, which is cool. Yeah. And it's just, it's, uh, no, it's fascinating. So, yeah. And I, sorry, go on. No, no, no. I was going to segue I, I was, to the next part. No, I was just going to say, I, I totally agree. And I think it's something I really wrestled with when I first set up my business. I found it, I, I thought, what do people want? What am I expected to deliver? Mm-hmm. What do businesses and, and corporates and, and organizations that I don't really know anything about because I'm so not from that world, what do they want? What? How am I going to fit into that? And it took me a little while to realize, that actually, I don't need to fit into mm-hmm. that. And, I, I, and that would be very odd if I tried to fit myself into it. And actually, I hope and I think people come to me because I am maybe something a little bit different and I'm not of that of the corporate world or of the business world so it's a it's a different perspective which hopefully can bring you know different viewpoints and then allow people to develop in a different way I think what's interesting is that it's because for me because you have the background that adds credibility it buys into the story as opposed to someone that just decides to set up one day because they've read one book and they do stuff that yeah okay fine which is not for me and i think it's that that's why i love podcasts because you get to hear people's stories and whatever that adds flavor to hopefully like you more that then anyone that watches this might be a lot more likely to engage because they get a vibe for what you like and what you've been through in your journey and your backstory and actually the the link with theater is incredible just to do with because I think one of the questions would be, I'm guessing from school, you were always the one, as you said yourself, that you put your hands up, you want to do theatre. I'm one of these really annoying people that if there's a stage at a conference, I kind of want to be on it, <laughs> which I, I, I've never admitted that before. But it's, I'm, all, you know what I mean? It, it's the kind of like, I, I want to be there. That's me. Yeah. That isn't the case for a lot of people. But what would you say to those kind of people is, you know, we are all different and if it's not your comfortable space and it's not your natural place where you would naturally want to be 
but you still have to do it. It's about finding things that can help you feel like you can manage it a bit better. Because if you've still got to do it, if you don't really sort of have a choice, if your role is such that you are still going to have to do that, it's not a it's not a choice that, that you can easily get around. Although I sometimes meet people, I've managed to avoid it for 20 years, but now I can't avoid it any longer, which is really hard. Then it definitely is about going, okay, it, that's all right that you don't want to be, you're not, oh, yes, please, I really want to go up there, but you've got to. So how can we make this the most positive, confident feeling experience possible? And that that's that's my job, to, to, to help whoever it is to, to feel that with, you know, various tools and, and working together to do that. Uh, and, then, and then at least you feel like you're in the best place that you could possibly be to tackle it. And I think that's like with anything, isn't it? it, it whatever your weakness is or whatever the thing that you find harder you 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 seek out and get get the support with i guess you know i i get support with ha and certainly did a, a lot in the early days about how how you run a business how you mm -hmm. you know because for me that was massively out of my comfort zone and i think just that thing of going it's okay to which i think we're all much better at now which is it's okay to ask for help and and support you know an area which kind of flashed to mind is that i've been fortunate enough to do two uh, best man speeches mm -hmm. i've got another one coming and it's petrifying because you can do all your prep, you get it ready. I gave one at a friend's wedding just before COVID. And it was, I'm not afraid to throw in some jokes. And, you know, occasionally, at my brother's one especially, I ripped him apart. I mean, it was even my friends from school and his friends from school were covering their faces shocked at how bad it was. But I did buy my niece's nephews that were probably about six all earmuffs before I started. That was okay. <laughs> but it's petrifying. And it's just, you know, I think that could be a little spin out that men, especially... Well, anyone who has to do that kind of thing oh the pressure is unbelievable yeah. Yeah. and it's the, the thing to really remember though because i've i've heard this before you know i i, I yeah right. i sometimes do get people ringing me up best man can you help the thing to remember though is that everybody's rooting for you yeah like particularly at a wedding everybody's rooting for you they're not sitting there thinking well, I, hope, I hope this is awful Boo. I really hope it's boring. I really hope it's, they're just not, are they? Everybody at a wedding's like, they want you to do well. They know that the pressure's on. They know, you know, and I always say, I always say to clients as well, who goes to a conference hoping it's going to be really dull, complete car crash. The person forgets everything. It goes horribly wrong. Nobody sits there thinking that really, do they? I mean, you know, we, we don't, we, we, we sit there sort of, I think for a lot of us thinking, oh, I, I don't know whether I would want to be up there in that way, but you're not, you're not hoping it goes wrong. So I always, and it, I know it's very easy to say it, but it is always just worth reminding yourself that, that generally people are, Drunk, are willing. You they are. don't care. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Maybe in a, particularly in a conference, maybe, maybe they don't care either. Yeah. There is that. So towards the end of every kind of interview, I have a little section which goes up on YouTube with its own separate thing. And I, this is actually my favorite bit because it's where I get to pick your brains. But actually, it's a nice little segment that, you know, hopefully adds and gives a lot of value. Um, would you be happy to share the best piece of advice you've ever had? Oh, can I can I share two? You can. Add, know. You know, everyone says that. Share as many Do as you they? want. Yeah. Uh, well, one's, one's from my dad who says, if something's worth doing, it's worth doing properly. And he's always said that, like my whole life which seems a bit simplistic but actually is a is a good thing to sort of hold on to um and i i yeah i really hold on to that and when i share a lot with and i don't know where i got this from because somebody said to me where did that come from the other day joe and i was like i don't know but comparisonitis mm -hmm. is the thief of joy mm -hmm which I, I love. And I, I try and, because when I'm doing my group training, people are like, oh, my, I don't want to go next. Mine won't be as good as Sandra's. And so I have to, oh no, theirs was really good. I can't go, you know. And I'm like, no, stop, 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 stop. S stay in your own lane, do your own thing. You are you, they were them. And yes, so comparing ourselves can just take the take the pleasure out of stuff, and it's it's something we all do, isn't it? Um, so I try and I try and hold on to that one as well, because certainly when I started my business, I was like, oh, what what are they doing? Should I be doing that? Should I be doing this? And you can just get lost. It, but because I, I, one of the things that with and it annoys me on LinkedIn, but on any platform, it's the when people all pretend to be perfect and they only ever show the perfect oh i nailed this i did 25 grand this month i did this i've yeah. done that but and it's like really honestly and it yeah. i think that humility of just like i've had a crap week 
my voice is yeah. gone i just want to get through today i don't even care what happens just i want to survive today i'll wake up tomorrow and you but people never say that and because that's one of the other things on the business point of view everyone always assumes that other people are making money when the truth is in a vast majority of cases they're actually not but it's that the feeling of inadequacy that they don't know what they're doing and someone else is doing better and you should know i really hate and it's that it, but a lot of people sit with these feelings when actually they don't have to and it's mm. but it's it's that kind of thing that i try and talk about it as much as i can but the um um and the other question if i'm allowed to move on is almost the you know you've had quite the journey and you said say at school and different challenges and stuff over time if you were to give advice to your younger self and you can pick any stage in your life you've last week whatever you want if you were to give advice to your younger self what would it be it would definitely be to worry less about what other people think which is kind of linked to our last point i guess hmm. yeah worry less about what other people think um i i yeah i would definitely i would definitely give that to my younger self because i did feel like i was the, the odd one out i didn't fit into my school and i didn't fit into all of that and i know that was and i look back on it now and just think none of it actually mattered but of course at the time it really mm. mattered um do and you I feel like that ever not held you back but when you wanted to leave being a barrister but you were worried about what people were going to yeah. say yeah absolutely oh t- totally really worried and, and i and i sensed that i whether there was or not but i sensed there was well why, why is she doing that and who's who's she to go and do that and mm. is it gonna work is it gonna be a success is it gonna i mean i i've i've i have since had a um someone who used to be in my sphere say you know i i i didn't think it was gonna work and i was totally wrong and i hold my hands up and i you, you were right and i was you know and but you do you've got to back yourself and that's really hard i used to have a um i, I don't have it up there anymore but i used to have a big piece of a4 paper and i wrote in really big block capital letters in bold red pen believe and i had it stuck right next to my computer screen so i'd see it every day to remind myself actually you know you can do this if you if you back yourself and you believe it. but it's really hard it's really hard um so i think i think i'll just always hold on to that because we're humans aren't we and we always do have those things of um doubt and- well, what i think is really interesting is that, uh, you, if you need to shoot off please tell me and i'll end the interview okay. if you're good is that with so tomorrow's international women's day yeah and actually you've been really excited then <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> well i'll ask you a question first then i'll go on to my point why do you feel that's important what in terms of that we have it because what i was going to say is and this is why i love talking to people so you know, with a lot of guests and a lot of the content that we consume is to do with imposter syndrome and worried about am i good enough and, and a lot of guests talk about this but i never had that i do occasionally have pangs of like I've said this in the in the past when I launched the roadmap and I had people say to me who the fuck do you think you are to even try and do that you're not good enough and when similar with you with being a barrister and you wanted to leave I used to work overseas in Jamaica after uni it seemed like this great job but I hated it and I wanted to quit and leave and even Chloe Clover last week wasn't feeling what she was doing needed to change her life but there was loads of people that said she was never good enough and she couldn't do it but almost my gut feel is that that feeling is more common in women and that's why yeah. i wanted to pick your brains yeah i think it's completely true i mean i i see it day in day out i haven't done analysis of the figures in mm. terms of the messages i get and i always send out pre-course questionnaires before i do training so i can understand a little bit more about the people that are coming along and it crops up and probably if i collated them the majority would be would be women and i'm i mean i'm, I'm not a psychologist i don't i don't know what why i couldn't answer that in that sense but it's definitely definitely mm-hmm. is what i explained doesn't mean i don't have men who mm-hmm. who come with mm-hmm. it as well i definitely do but it's definitely a, a um it's definitely a thing and i i'm excited about tomorrow because i partly because i just think it's a good opportunity to any opportunity to celebrate mm-hmm. anybody frankly is a, is a good thing isn't it in in this in this world at the moment and support each other and i feel like we don't we we should t- we should take every opportunity to support each other. I mean, regardless of gender, yeah, to be yeah. honest, regardless of gender. But um, it is definitely 
It is definitely a thing more in women, certainly in my sphere of work in any event. And I don't, I don't know why. Um, and I often get asked as well, um, should we, you know, I want, I want to try and be, I want to try and speak more like a man or I want to be more, um, I want to be more assertive or more that kind of thing. And my approach is very much, it's really important to be genuine and mm -hmm. be yourself. you, your yeah, communication yeah, yeah. yourself. It doesn't mean you can't bring those elements to the fore because you perhaps do do them and you do communicate like that, but you do it at home on the weekend with mm -hmm. the kids or the naughty dog or your partner or your, your mum or whoever it is. Uh, but then you go into a work environment mm -hmm. And it's like it disappears. You, it's not. Oh, it's not appropriate. Or oh, let's not do that. Or it's not perceived to be the right thing. Or whatever it is. And actually, you do have it there. It's just about how you choose to use it and allowing yourself to to do that. Yeah. I I love memorable people. There's nothing worse than when you go to a conference and it's just ten speakers, all vanilla, all bland. You can't remember a single one of them. I like the one that's slightly kooky that just but you remember them and they yeah. capture your inspiration and they they get you. And it's, yeah. I, I, personally, I love it when people bring personality to stuff that, you know, but the, the, you know, I guess the theme of your kind of everything you've said is that actually there are skills that we can learn, we can practice, you can get better. And then from my point of view, I, I've seen it hundred percent that your career path, or even if you're a business owner, your, your people's perception of you and how good you are and if they should hire you or not, and your general success rate will increase if you're better at communicating. And mm -hmm. I just think, especially it was when Greg mentioned it about two months ago, I was like, oh, I really want to get Joe on. And I picked you as opposed to other speaking coaches because I've seen you around and I vibe off you more than some of the others. And it's just, I relate better with women than I do often with men. It depends on the bloke, but yeah. it's just, it's, it's, I think it's important to kind of share the stories and, you know, let people know some of the tips and stuff that they call. Yeah. And I've, I've enjoyed kind of hearing your story as well. Um, is there anything you want to talk about or plug before we go? Um, can I plug something slightly random? You which can is plug I'm doing, whatever you want. I'm doing a run. Well, it's not a run. It's going to be a fast waddle because that's all I can manage. See the comedy uh, you do throw it in. <laughs> you just do it without noticing. Oh, it's not intentional. <laughs> but honestly, it really is a fast waddle. But I'm doing it for the Girls Network, who are an awesome charity, which is why I wanted to mention it. And obviously, it's International Women's Day tomorrow, and they're just fabulous. They're they're, they're national, and they work with young women, teenagers in school and, and just about to leave school from socio-economic deprived backgrounds mm -hmm. to give them the opportunity to. To be, be the best they can and have opportunities they wouldn't ordinarily have particularly through mentoring mm -hmm. and they're fabulous and it's it's Stacey Wagstaff who runs it in the northeast so I'm I'm going to be running it for them in Norway of all random places wow. um in 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 June so I've got a just giving page and if anybody wants to donate anything but even if you don't and you just want to find out about the girls network or you think you'd like to be a mentor awesome they're always looking for new mentors so anybody out there who wants to or is interested in that do check them out because they're they're fab and they're called the girls network cool well i hope that wasn't too painful for you as your first oh, okay. live chatty thing yeah. yeah i don't think i picked my nose did i uh, you did I, I was shocked nose. when you said that but do, do you yeah. generally have you ever what's the worst no, thing no that's... i don't know why no i don't know why i said that but i've had a guy come on training before group training and eat a burger on online and I was just so shocked. It's kind of stayed with me. And so now I'm like, just remember, don't pick your nose. I, so I've just had a chat. Uh, so the chat on Facebook, and I'm very sorry. This is very true. So he's in India and I need, to, this is a fault of mine. We're speaking too quickly. Oh, and this is a hundred percent, but this is, that's really good feedback. And genuinely, Bipesh, thank you. Because I want to get better. And again, when I speak at international audiences, I do slow down. We've just got a bit excited today, but that's a genuinely thank you for that feedback because it's, you know, yeah. I will learn and improve. But I apologize that we're too, but it's, it's, it's a really good point. And that, but again, it's when you, if you understand the audience that you can reach with yeah. different stuff is that, you know, there's 1.2 billion people in India who yeah. might love Joe Darby, <laughs> but, but, it, but it's true. And it's that kind of element of my bad, I, you know, I, I will improve for that. But this is what I love about doing this because I'm I'm obsessive with getting better. Yeah, well, feed, don't they say feedback is the food of champions? Wow, they do now. But no, honestly, thank you. Um, <laughs> I said well, it. Somebody else told me that, I think. <clears throat> well, thank you for your time today. I've really enjoyed it. 
Um, I'd, it, I'd seen you around for a long time. My wife had seen you speak. I think you spoke at People Power back in December. And I just, I love connecting with people in the network to kind of get a chance to learn a bit more about you and what you'll do and your stories and stuff. And then likewise, when this all kind of gets clipped up, most people don't engage with the um, live stream, but thank you to anyone that did. But actually yeah. it's the little highlights bit. You'll be amazed at how many of your friends or colleagues or people from different building societies or whatever, they'll comment and they like hearing people's stories because often we're all so busy in our day job doing stuff it's nice to see oh you see joe that thing i was really interested in. she's so nice <laughs> but that's well, it, i love doing that as well so um, it's been really nice having a chat um yeah. steve and, and getting to know a bit more about you as well to be honest yeah, so cool. yeah well yeah. um hopefully as you said in person i'll see you at some point soon um have a wonderful rest of your monday and uh yeah i'll speak to you soon Thanks, Thanks, bye bye, bye. bye.